Hi, I'm James Gardner, host of Your History, Your Story, a podcast for everybody who loves stories about interesting people and events told by those who uncovered them from within their own family trees. This, we hope, will inspire you to discover and celebrate your history and your story. Have you ever heard of Jefferson Davis? If so, perhaps you learned from a high school history book that he was the president of the Confederacy during the American Civil War. In this episode of Your History, Your Story, we'll be speaking with Jefferson Davis's great-great-grandson, Bertram Hayes Davis, who, along with his wife Carol, own Vicksburg Old Town Tours. The tours showcase historic Vicksburg, Mississippi. Bertram admits that he, like many others, knew little of his famous ancestor except for his role as the head of the Confederate government. However, in 1976, that all changed when he was elected president of the Davis Family Foundation, whose mission is to support programs, organizations, and events to educate people about Jefferson Davis and his life. From that point on, Bertram began a journey that enabled him to uncover the entire story of the life of his great-great-grandfather. Through his research, Bertram discovered that in addition to being the president of the Confederacy, Davis was also a plantation owner, slaveholder, West Point graduate, war hero, U.S. Senator, Congressman, Secretary of War, and author. Additionally, Bertrand found that Davis had experienced some great personal tragedies in his life, including the death of his first wife and several children. Bertram firmly believes in the importance of sharing all the facts when telling history, and will be sharing a full account of his great-great-grandfather's life so the listener can weigh the facts for themselves and ultimately answer the question, who was Jefferson Davis? I'd now like to welcome Bertram Hayes Davis to our show. Welcome, Bertram. Thank you. Well, it's really good to have you. I'm very excited about this interview. I've been a big Civil War buff most of my life. I thoroughly enjoy it, to study it, and you're Great, great grandfather is a very interesting person to read about. That is for certain. So I'm really glad to have you on the show. Well, I'm excited to be here and share what I know about my great, great grandfather with you. Terrific. So I'm going to start off, Bertram, by asking you, where were you born and raised? I was born in Colorado Springs, Colorado, as was my father and my grandfather and my great grandmother moved there in 1885. So we've actually been in Colorado longer than we were in Mississippi as a family of all things. So I did mention that Jefferson Davis was your great great grandfather, but can you take us through exactly how you are descended from him? Yes, matter of fact, Jefferson Davis had six kids four boys and two girls. All the boys will die before the age of 21. There are no male descendants of Jefferson Davis. The two daughters that survived, one of them was Margaret, and Margaret got married in Memphis, Tennessee in 1876 to a gentleman by the name of Joel Addison Hayes Jr. from Nashville, Tennessee, now living in Memphis. And they would be there until 1885, at which time they elected to move to Colorado Springs, Colorado for Joel Addison Hayes's health issues. He had asthma and probably who knows what else, but Memphis is kind of a swamp as if you've ever been there. And that's where the family went to. They will have four kids, three born before and one in Colorado Springs. And of those four kids, they were all Hayes's. Jefferson Davis dies December 1889 in New Orleans. And the Hayes family comes down to New Orleans and they're seeing their mother. Her mother is Verena Davis. Now, this story that I'm telling you was told to me by my great aunt Lucy. And I went to a family reunion of that many years ago and I hadn't seen her in 50 years. And I saw her and she's this little white haired lady with these sparkling blue eyes. And she points at me across this glade and say, Bertram. So I got to see her again, and we're having a long conversation during a Sunday meal. And she says, Bertram, do you know how you got your name? And I said, yes, I do. And she says, no, you don't. My mother was in the room. And I'm going, oh, my gosh, what does that mean? Well, in that hotel room that day, 
Marina Davis is there with all the Hayes kids and she looks around and goes, Hayes, 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 and walks over to the window and points out to where Jefferson Davis is lying in state and said, is that the only Davis? Isn't that a shame we can't do something about that? And they look around the room and there's my grandfather who's all of about six years old and they ask him to change his name and he come up with a new one, Jefferson Hayes hyphen Davis. They go to the state of Mississippi by the state of legislature and they change his name. And it's a document that's about one and a half by three feet. It's a huge piece of paper. It's still in the archives in Mississippi. It's hanging on my wall for a long time. That was his birth certificate. So his name was Hayes Davis. Today, you know, there's over a hundred or so descendants of Jefferson Davis in this country. And my lineage is the only one that carries both the last name Hayes and the last name Davis. When I heard your name was Hayes hyphen Davis, I was wondering about the history of that. And that explains it very well. That is, that is super interesting. So there's about 150 descendants right now, you said. I would say roughly, I don't know. The last genealogy we did in print was 1988 and there was probably close to 70 then. And that's two generations ago. Yeah, you know, you mentioned that Jefferson Davis lost four sons. What a lot of tragedy he dealt with. You know, it's ironic that the four sons all died before they were 21, two of them in infancy. One of them was yellow fever in Washington, D.C., was actually buried in the same cemetery that Lincoln buried his son at when he was there. Uh, one was obviously fell off the White House and hit his head when Jefferson Davis was president. So he and Lincoln both lost a son during the Civil War, which uh, is kind of an interesting thing that people really you know, need to know they both shared that same scenario. The oldest would be 21, Jefferson Davis Jr., and he will die of yellow fever in Memphis, Tennessee. I would imagine the sort of the, the heat, the summer months were really rough for disease in the South. Yellow fever was one of these plagues that came through. It came through in the early 1840s. It came back in the 50s. It has been here forever until, of course, the inoculation against yellow fever, but it was carried by mosquitoes and they were prevalent throughout the South. So it's that and malaria, two killing diseases. Yes. And you said that there was a, another daughter who did not have any children. Right? There was. Her name is Verena Ann Davis. She would be called Winnie. And Winnie was sent to Europe after Jefferson was uh, freed from prison. And she will live in Europe until about 1880. So she comes back and she's a teenager and has no idea who her father is. Nothing about it. Can't really speak. She speaks German better than English. She has to relearn her whole family history. She's very talented. She's an artist. She's a writer. And in the 1880s, of course, the reconstruction period had ended and the Southern political machine was back in force. And as Davis was there traveling around one point in time, he was too ill on a train trip and they introduced Winnie as the daughter of the Confederacy. That would be her title. And she will be that for the rest of her life. She only lived to be 33 years old. She will die of kind of a, a gastrointestinitis scenario in Rhode Island. Uh, now, Bertram, I want to ask you, when did you first hear or understand that you were descended from Jefferson Davis? You know, I can't exactly tell you what age. There was a painting of Jefferson Davis on my wall since the day I was born. So he's always there. Uh, and he's pointed out it's Jefferson Davis. And that's, uh, you know, you grow up in Colorado Springs and you have my great-grandfather Hayes, and you have a Hayes Davis, and you have Jefferson Davis, and it's very confusing. I mean, it's kind of hard to figure out who you are. Eight or nine, somewhere in there, where, you know, it was pointed out that that was who he was, and, but that was about the extent of it. It wasn't something that we lived for. It wasn't something that had any basis in Colorado, obviously, but I was aware of it. We would come back down to Mississippi often. We'd go to Bullwall's last home, and We'd go to Jackson and we'd, we'd see things that were his, but it wasn't something that we lived that, you know, put us in any particular place. So did you have any relatives, elderly relatives, say parents, grandparents or aunts, uncles, whatever, whatever, who shared any thoughts about 
Jefferson Davis to you when you were a kid or growing up? You know, interestingly, all my aunts and my grandfather obviously knew their, their grandfather, Jefferson Davis. They went to Biloxi, there's pictures of them, et cetera, et cetera. And not one of them reflected on what it was when they were a kid to meet him, not anything. So I was kind of left out there in this scenario of none of them really said anything about who he was or anything like that. It was uh, just a, a name. Hmm. That's curious, but you know, I, I think sometimes as a kid, you, there may be some discussions about it that maybe as kids, we don't pick up or we're not, you know, we've got other things we're doing, or maybe we're too young for it to be very important. But sometimes I've spoken to people who have fathers or grandfathers or grandmothers or whatever, who, who were in the war, they were in World War II or something like that. And they say, well, they don't really talk about it, or they didn't really talk about it. So sometimes people just don't talk about earlier days or ancestors or things like that. Well, we were certainly in that case because I don't remember ever having a conversation about my great, great grandfather. So in, I believe it's 1976 or around that time, you actually became the president of the Davis Family Foundation. How did you make that leap from really not knowing too much about Jefferson Davis to being the president of the Davis Family Foundation? Quite an interesting story there. I had no intention of doing that. I had actually enrolled at the University of Alabama Graduate School, and I was getting a degree in geology. And I went home one summer, and I'm hanging out, and my aunt gives me an envelope. It's an invitation to the Davis family reunion in Woodville, Mississippi at Rosemont Plantation. And my aunt kind of hands it to me and said, well, isn't that on the way to Tuscaloosa? Maybe you ought to drop by and see what this is all about. Well, just fit in the right time frame. It's the 3rd of, 3rd of June. It's his birthday. And so we, I did. I drove down to Woodville, Mississippi and walked into this family reunion. And there's the brothers of Jefferson Davis, of 10 of them. There's 10 brothers and sisters, a large component of, of Davis descendants. And just kind of spent the moment at Rosemont Plantation. That's his boyhood home. That's where he remembers growing up. That was where his mother and father lived. And it, it kind of struck me, but I didn't think too much of it. I'm just, you know, I'm a 20-something graduate student, and they've got all these lawyers and doctors and plantation owners and all these people. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of intelligence and wealth, and then there's me. But interesting, <laughs> on a Sunday afternoon, they elected to kind of create a nonprofit, a, an organization to keep the family going, and they call it the Davis Family Association. The long name is the descendants of Samuel and Jane Cook Davis Incorporated. And as you probably know, when you form one of those, you've got to have officers. And so they're going around saying, well, we've got to have a board, we've got to have officers, and they're going around the room. And they, they get to the office of president, and I'm standing next to my cousin. Now, my cousin's about six foot four. He's an all-American soccer player. He's a you know, banker, you know, just the guy. He's just you know one of those look up to me. And his father is on the other side of this glade about 20 feet away and raises his hand. His father says, there's only one person that should be president of the Davis Family Association and points across the glade. And I look at Davis, my cousin saying it must be him. He, she, he says, Bertram Hayes Davis. And I'm kind of going, you know, that's, that's weird. What was what, what he thinking? Hmm? I don't know what he's thinking. I mean, I'm as far away as I can get. But anyway, that moment changed my entire life because suddenly, you know, you are entrenched in this organization that represents the Davis family. And I asked him later, I said, why me? And he says, two reasons. First of all, you're young. You can continue for a long time. And obviously I have. But the other thing is, is you're the only Davis in the group. You're the only one that has a last name. Why would we not have a Davis and president of the... So that was his thought process for all that. And it turned out that it's still engaged today. We have a Davis reunion coming up this year, we think, in Rosemont. And uh, we've been doing it since 1976. And I've been to almost every one of them. And I guess I'm president for life. I'm not sure how long that'll last, but that's how that all occurred. What's interesting, I'm going to take it a step further. I walked away from that thinking, you know, I'm done. Every couple of years, we'll be good. 
I go back to Tuscaloosa and of course the newspapers had picked this up all over the South. And about two or three months later, I get a phone call from this lady by the name of Cameron Napier, Montgomery, Alabama. And Cameron Napier is a Southern belle that can just sweep you off your feet with her honey voice. She calls me and her voice is kind of Southern. She says, are you Bertram Hayes Davis? This conversation's about 20 minutes. And finally, she said, well, we are having a rededication of the first White House of the Confederacy in Montgomery. And I would like you to come and give the keynote speech at the rededication. Would you do that? Well, there's two problems. First, I've never given a speech. And the other problem is, is that what you know about Jefferson Davis before you ever woke was president of the Confederate States of America. And that's all that I knew too. So we're kind of gone. But I said yes and hung up the phone. <laughs> and right after that, I finally kind of considered, I don't know what I just did. Yeah, oops. I'm going to do it anyway. So I write this wonderful speech. It's six pages long, 14 font, double space, and I'm ready. And it's going to be 30 or 40 people, and I'm, you know, I'm ready to go. So I drive down to Montgomery, and I park my car, and I'm coming up the street, and the whole street's blocked off, and there's 500 people there, including the governor. I'm already a little bit scared, but now I'm petrified. I can't wait to get out of there. But as I'm giving the speech and I get done and I'm looking at it, I'm thinking to myself, all these people out here know more about my great-great-grandfather than I do. They're expecting me to know more than they do. And I don't. So I have two choices. I can either say, this is it. I'm all done with this. Just kind of like my father did. He went to one event and said, I'm not doing that anymore. Or I could learn something about him in case that happened to come again. Mm. And I elected to do the learning process, but I did it kind of an interesting way. It gave me an opportunity to travel. I mean, we like to travel. My wife's always wanted to travel. So we traveled everywhere Jefferson Davis has been that we can be. I mean, there are still places I haven't been, but I've from birth to death, I've stood there, been in every important place in America that he was, and I've experienced what he saw there, and I tried to put myself in his place, and so when I talk about him, I'm not talking about I read it in a book or, you know, whatever. I'm saying, you know, I stood there and I'm thinking this is what he was thinking about. This is what was going on in his life at this time. I've gathered all these great stories. It's enabled me then to share that with America. That is wonderful. And I'm glad that you said that about going to visit the places that he was. I've read different authors who have done interviews later saying that they went to the places where the different things they were writing about happened and that it gave them a really good sense of just, I don't know, I think it just, it helps you understand people, events and places better. And since you have learned so much more about Jefferson Davis, I'd like if you can to help us understand who he was. And could we start off with what I understand to be a pretty big coincidence that Jefferson Davis was born not that far away from where Abraham Lincoln was born in Kentucky. Is that true? That is absolutely correct. About 175 miles and one year difference in the state of Kentucky. And ironically, up until last year, if you had gone to the state capital of Kentucky, it's the only place in America that I know that there are or were statue of Lincoln next to a statue of Davis. So you could compare and contrast the two individuals. However, today Lincoln is there and Davis has been removed. He's been actually sent to his birth site, which is in Fairview, Kentucky. Right. Now let's talk about Jefferson Davis's family. First of all, I think Jefferson was the youngest of about 10 children. That's correct. Yep. And his father was a Revolutionary War veteran. Yes, yeah, Samuel Emory Davis. And he was originally from North Carolina and he did enlist in the Revolutionary War. He fought under Greene in Georgia and North Carolina. Of course, they were ones that actually won the war. If you go back and look at those skirmishes in Georgia in that period of time. But he did serve in the Revolutionary War and was awarded a, a land grant, which he then moved to Kentucky. And that's where Jefferson was born. And many of the kids were born in Fairview, Kentucky. And what kind of uh, 
relationship did Jefferson have with his dad? That's a good question. And, you know, when I look at it, I wonder myself, because his oldest brother was 24 years old, Joseph, when Jefferson was born. So there's a span of kids coming here, and Samuel's trying to make ends meet in Kentucky, and he, he's making it, but he thinks there's a better life. They actually leave Kentucky when Jefferson's two years old, and they come down to Louisiana, Bayou Tesh area. A matter of fact, we stood in the exact same area that they moved to for about a year before they decided to move to Mississippi. And we're on that bank of that bayou, and we're there for an hour, and I think I got about 80 mosquito bites. So they lasted oh. almost a year there before they moved to Woodville. But he was trying to, to take advantage of the opportunities to have a bigger land and, and provide more for his family. So he did all he could. He did not succeed. He would not become any wealthier than he, than he was. He was just striving just to, to make ends meet did build a beautiful house in Rosemont Plantation, still there today, refurbished 1840. You can go look at it. But, you know, he wasn't going to be any more than just a, an ordinary small planter in his life. I read that Jefferson Davis had an interesting middle name that you don't hear very often, and it was Finnis. And why is that? I imagine Jane looked at Samuel and said, Tins enough. <laughs> that's all we're having <laughs> i figured that's that was the reason <laughs> that's the reason we've been given it's not in writing anywhere that she said that but it certainly makes sense makes a lot of sense so bertram i understand that jefferson davis's father samuel took a big interest in his youngest son and then when he passed away his older son joseph became a father figure to jefferson yeah, I, I think it's important to realize that Samuel really was engaged in his youngest son. I mean, Jefferson was kind of the apple of his eye. And he went to extremes to make sure Jefferson had everything that he could have, including education. For instance, at the age of 10, Jefferson went on a little pony ride to a private school in Lexington, Kentucky, 795 miles on a pony with an entourage, and that was arranged by his father, who had a friend that was in the war with him that was going up with his son. Interesting, during that trip, they stopped in Nashville, and Major Hines served under Andrew Jackson. They stay there for several weeks, and Davis will write in his biography that that changed his whole perspective, because Jackson knew where the country was going. And they would have these great conversations at night. Even at that age, he understood what was going on and listened intently. And he said, it opened my eyes up to the possibilities. He will come back two years later because Jane put her foot down and said he's been gone long enough. And interesting, he would not ride a pony back. He would get on one of the first steamboats on the Mississippi River. So mm. he saw that at an age that, you know, it'd be like a 10-year-old getting on a Concord, kind of same thing. So Samuel was really into his education possibilities. Jefferson did suffer that same thing that a lot of teenagers do. He got into a class once and said it was too hard. And his dad said, fine, come on out and we'll go to work in the field. And he did that for a day and did it for another half a day. And finally, he said, you know, maybe school's not so bad after all. And he did go back and never would he said another word about the academics. Joseph kind of started to get engaged at that time, but he really didn't get engaged until he went to Transylvania College and back to Lexington. And by that time, Samuel's quite old. Joseph's wealthy, and he's starting to take the reins of his, his younger brother. So his relationship with Joseph was his really almost his second father. Mm -hmm. He would tie into him as his life goes on. So very strong relationship between him and all of his sisters raised him. So there was a lot of family there, but Joseph's the, the key to the rest of his life. And I understand that Joseph is the one who eventually advised Jefferson to go to West Point, right? advised or just told. <laughs> I would say told. It was like uh, Samuel wanted him to go. Joseph 
wanted him to go. So between the two of them, they manipulated to get him an appointment. Now, Joseph, by that time, was very powerful. This is 1824. He had immense power. Davis is 16 years old. He doesn't really have any power. But what's interesting is that Jefferson said he wanted to go to Jefferson's College, which would be at the University of Virginia. That's really where he wanted to go. Mm-hmm. And Joseph said, you go to West Point for one year, and if you don't like it, you know, we'll, we'll change schools. Obviously, he was, he was able to, to get there and even with all of his troubles, graduate. Talk about those troubles. I have to ask you about this. What was the eggnog riot? Jefferson had a way. I mean, he had a little chip on his shoulders. There's just, just no question about it. Let me, let me back up and give you this entrance scenario, which is just phenomenal. Samuel dies right after he gets his letter from acceptance. He's in Kentucky. He gets his letter of acceptance, and his father dies. He didn't get to see him before he died. And so he's kind of distraught. So he sends a letter to Calhoun, who's the Secretary of War, saying, I'm coming but I'm going to be late and I'm going to take some time off and no explanation. I'm just not going to be there when you want me to. So he shows up late. He's a couple of weeks late getting to West Point. When he gets there, he walks in the door and said, I'm here ready to go. And they said, time out. You know, who, who are you? Where are you? What are you doing? You must take an entrance exam. And Davis goes, really? And what would that be? And they said, well, it's reading, writing, and arithmetic, math. Davis's math is a little bit suspect. There's not a lot of math in liberal arts education in the South. But the guy who's there actually hands him a book and says, here's a math book, read it tonight, because tomorrow you're going to be asked a math question. And the next day he's asked a math question, in geometry. And for some reason, he was able to impress the professor that he knew something about geometry, and he was admitted in. So he's already behind the eight ball when he gets there. And as he gets there, he befriends the older cadets. He's just 16. So he's looking for, you know, people. And and Albert Sidney Johnson's one of those folks. He's almost 20 years old at this time. So starts hanging out with these guys. They had the tendency to kind of sneak off and go down the riverbank to a place called Benny Hills Tavern. So he did that quite often, actually got caught once and almost expelled for drinking. But he gets out of that one. But then Christmas comes along, second year he's there, and every Christmas Eve they would make eggnog. And in the eggnog they met, you could put a match in, it would burn. They would import a whole lot of stuff to put in it. So they're making the grog, and Davis hears that the faculty is out looking for him. So he runs down the hallway to the room, opens the room, and says, boys, put away the grog, the faculty's coming, and the next boy says, We're already here. They just followed him right into the room. Now, Davis would get 286 or some odd number of demerits in four years. A lot. I laugh when I read every day, did something. (laughs) Didn't tie his shoe, didn't make his bed, was late. I mean, he did them all. But this is the only time that he actually did obey his order. He went back to his room and he went to bed. Later that night, there was a skirmish between the faculty and drunken cadets, and over a third of the population of West Point was expelled. There's a book written about it. It's a little bitty book of eggnog riot. (laughs) That sounds like a good holiday gift for somebody. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) So he didn't get expelled. So what about Jefferson's military career after he graduated from West Point? He did serve eight years in the Army. He left West Point. He went to Wisconsin territories, and, and there was a war going on up there called the Black Hawk Wars, the Indian Wars, as they call. And one of the things that happened during that period is Black Hawk is actually apprehended. They captured Black Hawk. The contingent that comes up from St. Louis on the boat gets cholera, and they all die or they can't come. And so Zachary Taylor, who is the commanding officer, appoints Jefferson Davis to escort Black Hawk from Prairie du Chien to St. Louis, Missouri, on a riverboat. As they go down the river, every time the boat stops, people would gather along the riverbank to see Black Hawk. But Davis protects him all through that trip. And at the end of the trip, Black Hawk presents him with one of his most cherished possessions, his pipe. Mm. That pipe is in my safety deposit box today. It's still within the family. 
So that was one of those moments. Also, Jefferson Davis will fall in love with Zachary Taylor's daughter. He will ask Taylor his permission to marry. And Taylor says, not going to happen. No daughter's going to wear in the military. Davis kind of gets transferred to Arkansas, far away as he can get her. But they are still in love, and they elope in Louisville, Kentucky, and they get married. They will come back to Mississippi to see all the brothers and sisters. They get to St. Francisville, and 91 days later, she dies of malaria. Oh, no. That changes his life. This is a happy-go-lucky guy. I mean, he's really got the world by the, by the tail, and he's going to make a difference, and it devastates him. He actually, his brother sees him and sends him to Cuba. He's in Cuba for a couple of weeks recovering, almost gets arrested for sketching the forts and escapes that and goes to New York. And then finally, he comes back to Vicksburg, about 12 miles south of where I'm sitting. And that's where Joseph had his plantation. And he will be there for eight years. And during that eight-year period, he will study law with Joseph and he'll build his plantation. And then he will meet Verena Howell from Natchez, as arranged by his brother, and the second marriage comes. Now, interesting. To get from Vicksburg to Natchez to the wedding, you go out and get on a riverboat. And they're like taxi cabs back then. I mean, there's there's a bunch of them. And to get on a boat, you go build a fire, raise a flag, whatever it is. And the boat fills up. You get on it arbitrarily. He gets on a boat. And who's on the boat? Zachary Taylor. But he hadn't seen him since the death of Sarah Knox. He thinks maybe I'm going to die here. You know, He's got a gun and a sword in him. But they do reconcile, and that will change their lives because Jefferson will go back to Mississippi, get elected to go to the U.S. House, but resign and come back. And he will join his ex-father-in-law in Mexico in the Battle of 1847. And they became uh, pretty close uh, at that point, didn't they? Very close. Matter of fact, when they come out of that skirmish, I would call it, and I guess it was a war, Zachary Taylor obviously rides the coat strings and becomes president. Davis becomes the senior senator from Mississippi, but during that 18 months of Taylor's presidency, he dies of food ailment. Davis spends a lot of time in the White House, and he's at Taylor's deathbed when he dies. Yeah, and I recall reading that Zachary Taylor died after eating a bowl of cold milk and cherries, and the suspicion is that the water was so fetid in Washington, D.C. at that time, that the milk uh, could easily transmit disease. And that's why he died. That's exactly what happened. Yeah, he lost his father-in-law. But now he's got a new wife, Mm -hmm. right? And how long after his first wife did Jefferson remarry? Almost 10 years. Almost 10 years. He gets married again in 1845. That's when they get married. They will go to Washington. They'll spend that 18 months. And then he comes back and goes to the war. After he comes back from the war, he goes back to Washington, D.C. for a while. He comes back to Mississippi in 1851, and everything's good. Got his house, got his wife, going to start a family. The world's a great place. Everything's going okay. So Jefferson goes into politics, but he is selected to be President Franklin Pierce's Secretary of War. Can you tell us about that? Interesting, isn't it, that that would happen? And there's a reason. And we didn't know this reason. We, we try to learn as much as we can as we go along. And about many years ago, we were invited to a presidential forum in Dallas, Texas. They have a presidential library there, and they have a presidential study or association. And one of the speakers was talking about Franklin Pierce. And Carol and I said, we got to go. We got to learn about Franklin Pierce. Well, it was not actually about Pierce, but it was about illnesses that affected presidents. And Pierce was one of them. And we were kind of curious about what was that all about. Well, it wasn't really an illness. It was an event. So between the time Pierce is elected and the time that he takes office, he and his wife, Jane, and their last remaining son, Benjamin, are on a one-car train going to a funeral, and the train derails. And Benjamin, their son, is impaled in front of them. Oh. So Jane just goes into severe depression. She's almost Mary Todd Lincoln, not quite to that extent. And when Pierce is forming his 
cabinet. He's looking for strength. He's looking for people that can kind of you know, take over without him really helping. And he knew Davis from the war, so he asked Davis. And Davis said no. I mean, he did no many times. Finally, he went up to Washington, got behind the closed doors, and there he was. But he was uh, Secretary of War. Now, what's interesting is that not so much Jefferson is that powerful guy, but what happens to Verena? Verena gets to Washington, and she's got a young son. And Jane Pierce sees the kid and adopts him. Literally, they are almost in the White House daily, comforting Jane with this presence of this kid, because she doesn't have any kids left. Mm -hmm. So Verena and Jane Pierce are glued together with this kid in the middle and Jefferson and Pierce, therefore, have, you know, Jane's happy, I'm happy, Jefferson's happy, Marina's happy. So there's a big happiness circle going on. So Jefferson gets about anything he wants, obviously. And Marina's an acting first lady during this time. There's a lady by the name of Cokie Roberts who just recently passed away. She wrote a book, The Capital Dames, and she picked five women of the 1850s, of which Verena was one of them. And we met her and we saw her and she's just excited to see us. I mean, it's like we're old friends and we're kind of going, you're Cokie Roberts, we're nobody. But she says, you are somebody because your great, great grandmother was the capital dame of the 1850s. The rest of them were there, but she was the one simply because what happened at the White House during those four years, she became immensely powerful. That's very interesting. So Jane Pierce was grieving terribly. So it was hard for her to really conduct business of first lady. So your great, great grandmother was there not only to support her in that role, but providing this young son there who I, I'm, I'm sure that Jane felt that it was almost like having her little boy there as well. Unfortunately, it's a tragic scenario because that young son will die of measles in that period of time. And that's the one that's buried, was buried in Washington, D.C. Oh, my goodness. That's, that's awful. So Jefferson Davis is the Secretary of War under Pierce, which is a pretty powerful position. And there are a lot of things that he accomplished, but two very important things that he did. One related to construction on the Capitol building, and the other one has to do with transportation and the railroad. Could you tell us about those two things? I'd be glad to. It's actually an ironic story because Davis, again, didn't want the job. And when he got there, there was an expansion project going on at the Capitol, which he was aware of. And it was a mess. And he managed to put it underneath the War Department, which means all the construction would be approved by the War Department. He hired the architect, he hired the engineer, and he would also hire the artists that came in and did all the artistic interpretations that you see, there, all the beautification. He was fully engaged in that process for four years. Now, the building would start, and you know it wasn't completed, obviously, until after the war, but the framework that you see of the building, all of the designs and all the arts and all of the selection of materials was almost all done during that period from 1852 to 56. Mm -hmm. Really? And what seems unusual is that the Secretary of War would be involved in the construction of a government building. Why was that? Because the Army Corps of Engineers was the building company for the United States government. Still is today, actually. If you look at all, any major projects that the government's building, it's the Army Corps of Engineers. It's probably engaged to a large extent. Interesting. And, and is that the same reason why Jefferson Davis was involved with the Transcontinental Railroad? To a certain extent. That was a surveying project. In other words, the surveyors had to be collected. They had to, routes had to be kind of designated and all those folks had to be sent out into the wild frontier. And that again, fell underneath his authority and guidance. And so today there's, I think there's a 11 or 12 volumes of the Transcontinental Railway Survey. They're great big, huge books. 
And in the last volume is all the maps. And I've seen one and it's amazing. You open it up into great maps and each one of them has his signature on it, approving that as, as a survey draft. That is interesting. That is something I never knew. I mean, I've been studying history for a long time and I did not know that. I did not know about Davis's involvement in the building of the Capitol. Those are two really fascinating stories. So that brings us to the late 1850s. So what happens in that period of time after he leaves his position as Secretary of War and he becomes the president of the Confederate States of America? You know, that's the period that I struggle with, 1856 to 1861. Davis is by that time one of the most powerful people in Washington, D.C. He's a senior senator from Mississippi, a very wealthy state, tremendous power, but also a slaveholding state. And Davis and his brother had kind of addressed the scenario of slavery right early on. And on Davis Bend, the Davis brothers had created a utopia for slaves, almost a free society. They were given things that most slaves would only wish for, education, business opportunities, self-governance, religion, marriage. So on Davis Bend, the newspaper articles would say Davis is free Negroes. Even though they were slaves, they were given every opportunity to better themselves. They're ready. And Davis knew what it was going to take. He knew that was the secret. You have to give the slaves the opportunity to learn, to, to have that so they can go on. And during that four years, he knew what it was going to take. But why didn't he do something? What would it take? The thing that it would take would be a monetization. The slave owners had a lot of capital tied up in slaves. If we had have done exactly what Britain did, which was to pass a bond issue for several billion dollars in monetaries and free the slaves, matter of fact, it would have given the opportunity for them to become part of society. But you also have to realize that by the time 1856 comes in and he's in the Senate, there's a new movement, the abolitionist movement, the Republican Party. And they don't want anything to do with that. They only want free of the slaves, no matter what. And maybe he thought it was too much of an uphill battle. Or maybe it's politics. You know, if I do this, I'm probably not going to get reelected. I don't know. But it bothers me tremendously. And when I talk about it, I said, you know, he could have made a difference. He could have made an alternate decision. So instead of what the abolitionists were calling for, which is immediate, complete emancipation, his thinking, or he and his brother had a theory or a plan where there would be education, there would be opportunity that would eventually evolve into emancipation. Am, am I correct in saying that? That would be my thought. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and to prove that, you know, I always go back to what happened after Vicksburg fell and freed slaves started to migrate in Mississippi, they all heard about Davis Bend. Now, there were 750 or so slaves on Davis Bend in 1863. The population swelled to thousands because they wanted to engage in this, and they knew where it was, and they went there to learn. Bertram, can you explain to us what was Davis Bend? The Mississippi River meanders greatly. It bends around. It's not a straight line. It looks like a bowl of spaghetti if you overlay it. And one of the bends in the river was the area that Joseph went and bought and created his plantations. And on a map today, it is still called Davis Bend on the Mississippi River. Davis Bend became Davis Island in the 1870s as the Mississippi River changed course. Still there today, but now called Davis Island. What the Davis brothers did for the, not only the enslaved, but the free slave was to give them that opportunity. So it would have worked. It just never happened. We don't know why he, he abandoned perhaps his principles or his ideas, but it could be that he felt it would not be palatable for the rest of the Southern states at that time. 
Well, he also realized that his small number of slaves was not the entire population of slavery. I mean, he understood that the large majority of slaves did not have what his slaves had. They didn't have any education. They didn't have any self-governance or business. They were just slaves, and he, they needed a period. It's not going to be an instantaneous scenario. And so that's why he was such a proponent of holding on to slavery, because he knew instantaneous freedom was not going to really be the answer. And he needed to have that solution long term. Yeah, and for our listeners, I think we have to understand the context of this is mid-19th century. Clearly, slavery was an abhorrent institution in this nation, and thoughts of owning another human being is unthinkable. But then again, we have to understand the historical context of the situation. Slavery was entrenched in society in the South. It had been you know, since the 1600s, and the economic system was largely based on it, undergirded by it. You had generations of families who had held slaves. It's easy to say now, this is the way it should have been done, but you got to also think about the, what it was like in those days. What, what's the context? And the rest is history, as they say. Right. I deal with that a lot. It's, it's one of those struggles I have because he was a proponent of slavery. There's no question about it. His speeches were all about slavery and the protection of that environment and whatever. And I'm looking at it saying, why? And I'm still trying, you know, my own old soul trying to figure that out. So it is what it is. And the lens of perspective, I just can't go back there and tell you. And it's hard. We may never fully understand what Jefferson Davis was thinking or why he abandoned those thoughts. Bertram, didn't Jefferson Davis have one particular slave by the name of James Pemberton, who was actually a pretty close friend of his? He was actually almost the same age as Jefferson Davis. They grew up together at Rosemont. He actually traveled with Davis. He was with him in the army. He held all of his important things. He would come back to Mississippi he would run the plantation when Jefferson was gone. And in 1852 or thereabouts, he passed away. Mm-hmm. And it was a blow. They never did ever fill that gap, but it was a like losing a family member. Yeah. But they were very, very close. Matter of fact, Davis offered him his freedom. He said, I'm going to let you go and you can do it. And he says, no, I don't want that. Mm-hmm. I want to always be with your family in whatever it is you need me to do. And so when Davis goes to Washington, he leaves James Pemberton here and he runs Briarfield until his death. So let's go now to 1861. Lincoln has been elected president and the Southern states are talking secession seriously. And Jefferson Davis is sworn in as the president of the Confederacy. How was that decision for him? What do we know about that decision to accept that position? Well, it's ironic the way that it happened, I think. Davis is in Washington and he resigns. Full packed Senate chambers. I mean, it's standing room only. But he does resign and he come back and he does not go to Montgomery, Alabama. That's where the Constitutional Convention is going to be. That's where the entire leadership of the South gathers. He wants nothing to do with that. He's not a secessionist. He's not a fire breather. He's a compromise. And he says, you know, gentlemen, you're going to do this, but do it right because it's important to get it right. I'm going home. And he does. Comes to Davis Bend, which is right down the road from where I'm at. And he's with his wife and he's expecting to become a general. And that's not to be the case. They meet in a convention and they're looking for candidates and his name comes around and finally they do decide that it's going to be Jefferson Davis. And they send a telegram to Vicksburg, Mississippi, and a horse rider goes down to Briar Field, and there's a mural here on the wall. There's Jefferson and Verena and Rose Garden and the guy with the telegram saying, you've been elected president of the Confederate States of America. Come to Montgomery as soon as possible. Now, when I talk about that moment, here's what I say. If Carol and I were standing there someday and somebody came up and gave me a telegram and said, you've been elected chairman of the board of J.P. Morgan Chase Bank, come to New York City as fast as possible. I would turn around to my wife and we would have a conversation. You know, we're going to do this, whatever. Jefferson doesn't have that conversation with Verena. 
because for 52 years, have you noticed anything in his life that he's actually had any control over? No, he's always served someone or somebody or a constituency. This is a call to duty. That's what he believes. That's what he understands. He goes in, he packs his bag, gets on a boat, comes to Vicksburg the next day and catches a train to Montgomery. No second thoughts. Now, he didn't want the job. His wife looked at him and said he turned ashen as he read the telegram because he knew, you know, he knew what was going to happen. But he still took it, even though that wasn't what he really thought he should be doing. We could probably talk for hours about Jefferson Davis's presidency of the Confederate States. But just a couple things I noticed from what I read, it seems that he was very interested in details that he, if you want it done right, get it done yourself. How did that work for him or how did it work against him? The devil is in the details. Well, unfortunately, the details were Davis's devil. It's interesting to watch him. Now, the one thing that he tried to do the most unsuccessful was to manage the generals. He had a cadre of egos. I mean, you don't become a general without having an ego. I made that statement in a lecture once, and after that, this guy came up to me, and he says, my name's General So-and-so, <laughs> but you're right. We are egotistical, or else we would not become generals. You don't ever change that. But he couldn't manage them. They did whatever they wanted to do. He didn't have command control system like the United States Army did. He tried to involve himself in every one of those details, generals and battles and domestic policies. And at the same time, he would write a letter to, dear Mrs. Jones, your son has passed away in the battle of whatever, or he wasn't allowed to become sergeant because of whatever. So the details killed him. He would work 20 hours a day worked harder than any person should. And his health, by the way, was miserable. He has a bad eye. He's lost sight in his left eye. He has neuralgia. He can't sleep. He has stomach issues. And there was a book written about his presidency. And they said that never has anybody that sick worked that hard for that long of a period of time. And of course, he loses a son in the middle of the war too, just like Lincoln. So that was his downfall. I mean, he did all he could. He gave it all, but he gave too much and dealt with things that he should not have dealt with. You're right. Do you think his real desire would have been to be in uniform and be leading troops in battle as opposed to being the president of the Confederacy? In the first battle of Bull Run, he was down in the second day talking to Johnson and saying, why aren't you attacking? Yes, that's what, his, that's what he wanted to be. And he didn't have that. You know, he did all he could. He tried to be a general from a presidential scenario, but there were too many other issues that got in the way. He would have been a great general, in my opinion. So we all know the outcome of the Confederacy. Lee surrenders to Grant at Appomattox in April of 1865. Lead us through what happened to Jefferson Davis During those times where the army was surrendering and the Confederacy was falling apart, what happened to him? You know, there's an interesting book that's been written called April 1865, and I've read it now twice. And the reason that I've read it is that's the month that changed our entire country. changed Jefferson Davis, but it changed the country too. So early in April, Lee sends a telegram to Davis. I think it's April 4th that Petersburg falls and you need to leave. He'd already sent his family on ahead. Their wife and kids are gone. And he takes off on what we call a, I guess it was an escape, we'll call it that. And he goes to various places. And ironically, I told you that I've been everywhere Davis was. We reenacted his flight 150 years later, almost to the day. We were in a church in Richmond, Virginia, at the hour in the same pew that he got the telegram saying Petersburg has fallen and he walked out of the church. And I didn't get up and walk out of church, but if I had my cell phone on and somebody had called me, it would have been a great moment to reenact. But I'm sitting there during that moment thinking, what is he thinking? His family's gone. What is he thinking? His thought process is I'm still president. I have to lead. 
but I have to lead from strength, not from weakness. I don't need to cower. I need to continue whatever it needs to take. So he moves the government. He goes to Danville. He goes on to Greensboro. He goes on to, to Charlotte, et cetera. And it's interesting. We made that same trip almost 150 years later. And one story I'll tell you that's kind of ironic is that we went to Greensboro. And when he showed up in Greensboro, the train was leaking, the cars were wet and whatever. And he gets off the train. They said, no, we want you to stay on the train. We don't want you to be here because if we tell somebody you were here, they might burn the house down that you stayed in. We show up 150 years later. Everybody else had an event, they had a fundraiser. We had speeches. We had lunch in Greensboro, and then we left. So it was ironic. The day that changed everything is Charlotte. He's there, and he's handed a telegram, and the telegram says Lincoln has been assassinated and is dead. Changes everything. It changes the country, and it changes Davis. Because Davis suddenly realized he's going to be wanted. He's going to be wanted. Matter of fact, it doesn't take three days before the wanted posters for the assassination of Abraham Lincoln wanted Jefferson Davis for $100,000. So his flight is now to what? To see his family, because he knows if they see him, they're going to kill him. He takes off and goes after him. And he's out there for 30 some odd days. And then suddenly one night, and he runs onto a wagon train in Washington, Georgia, and it's his wife and family. Just because God wanted that to happen. There's no plan of their meeting, but they do. He spent one more day with them. He wanted to spend one more day. Verena said, go on. He said, no. The next day, the union does catch up with him. Davis hears the gunfire in the tent, rushes out, and as he washes out, Verena puts kind of a shawl around him because it's a cold, damp day in May. And as he gets to the rifleman on the horse, he's pointing a rifle at him. And Davis is going to get and pull that rifle down and pull the guy off the horse and get on the horse and escape. And Verena sees this. Verena comes over and stands between the guy and Davis, preventing that happening. Because Davis, with Verena's not there, he's dead and the story's over. So what does it mean? I mean, it's like divine intervention. God said you're going to live, but the only way you can do it is have your wife because she's going to protect you from your own self. And so he was. And so they're captured and they go to Savannah. They get on a boat and go to Fortress Monroe. And he's going to be there for two years, no charges. The first eight months, he's in a, a cell on the water. It's a horrible, it's a casemate. It's, it's still there today. His bed's there. I've sat on the bed. He has his only pipe. Davis had his pipe from Blackhawk there because it was on display. But finally, after a couple of years, you know, even people like Horace Greeley are saying, what are you holding? Well, you got to charge him with something. And they want to charge him with all kinds of things, but they can't quite figure out how they're going to make it stick. And finally, they get a bail hearing in Richmond, Virginia in 1867. And He's released on bond. The bond is $100,000. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been in jail for two years and my plantation's gone. And where am I going to get $100,000? Mm -hmm. People like Horace Greeley and Cornelius Vanderbilt signed his bail bond, releasing him. And he walks out of the same building that his office was in, which is the courthouse in Richmond, Virginia. I've been in his office. They're all in the same building. That's got to be interesting being a descendant, being in that same room. Do you know why Greeley and Vanderbilt put up that money? What was their reasoning? They were afeared. Remember, during this period of time, there's, there's a lot of things going on. After Lincoln's assassinated, I mean, the whole world comes unglued. There's a lot of things going on. The South is under military ownership. There's districts and their fear is that if they're going to do it to him, they might do it to others too. I mean, this, this, rampant disregard for people's rights. So their issue was, if you're going to charge him, charge him. If you're not, you got to let him go. The big issue was treason. You have to understand, though, to be treasonous, you have to actually act. You have to do something. Mm -hmm. He didn't do anything. I mean, the Sal had already seceded. They had formed a government, and he was appointed a position. He wasn't the leader of that instigation. So when they tried to get him as that leader, they couldn't quite get there because he didn't do anything. He just was an elected 
byproduct of the scenario. Chase said, you know, if you try him, you have the risk that he's going to win. And if he wins, all bets are off. He's going to travel a lot after that. And he's getting letters from his lawyer. He goes to England a lot saying, just stay there. And his purpose was, no, I want my day in court and I'm coming back. And so he did. So that was what I was going to ask you about. Civil War ends in 1865. Jefferson Davis spends two years in prison. I understand that at some points they had him in leg irons and they had kept the room bright so he couldn't sleep or he wouldn't have privacy. So it was two hard years in jail that he spent. It got softer towards the last part, but the first couple of months, and there was a guard in there 24 hours a day. So Bertram, Jefferson Davis has 24 years of life after his presidency of the Confederacy. One of the things I've read is that he needed a job. He needed to generate income. And what did he do? You mentioned England. What kind of ventures did he get into to try to support his family? He thought that the English support would enable him to become kind of a, a representative. He went over there on the invitation of many Southerners who were there before, stayed in all kinds of really, really great, great places. But his idea was, if I can make that connection with England, I can make a job out of this. But it never did come. So when he came back, the only job he was, well, he was offered several positions, but the job that he took was with the Carolina Insurance Company in Memphis, Tennessee. And they had a great thing going. They were selling a wonderful product. They were selling life insurance to Confederate veterans. Just think of that for a few minutes and then you can <laughs> smile to yourself going, really? Come on, give me a break. But that's what the company was doing and he was the president. So everybody was signing on the dotted line. The unfortunate thing is that it was really a Ponzi scheme. You know, they were paying whoever's money came in, paid somebody else. There wasn't really an escrow account going and it lasted for about eight years and went broken. But he needed to have a living and he was paid a pretty decent wage and he had a house in Memphis and and I always tell people, if he hadn't gone there, I wouldn't be here because Margaret, the only daughter who got married, married a guy named Joel Addison Hayes Jr. in Memphis, Tennessee. Oh, there it is. It'll, it all worked out That's for you. It, it worked <laughs> out for me. Absolutely. I also understand that he and Verena spent a lot of time apart from each other during that period. Do you sense from what you've read or heard that they were having problems in their marriage at the same time he was trying to earn a living? You know, Verena and Jefferson always had their, their moments. They, they weren't the, the most loving, joyous couple you've ever She's strong, hard, strong will, just had her own thought process, and he's strong, hard. So their relationship was give and take for a long period of time. And there were some periods. However, the capture changed everything. Even though there was a disagreement every once in a while about what she was right there. I mean, she's not going to let go. She was right in letter. She's the one that got the leg irons removed. She, she did everything in her power to make him as comfortable as possible. As they go on in Memphis, you know, she didn't really like Memphis. It's not where she wanted to be. She traveled a little bit around there. But the break really came when he moved to Biloxi. He rents a library cottage from a lady who owns Beauvoir and goes down there to write his memoir. And she wants nothing to do with the Gulf Coast or whatever. And there's a long period there that uh, they're not together. And even after the war, there was a period where she's in France a lot of the time and he's here. And of course, Margaret's in school in France, Winnie's in school in Germany. So there's a lot of that going on. But they come back together in Biloxi and, and they maintain a relationship, but the strength came from the imprisonment. I think that she would never ever you know, turn her back on him, but she just wanted to have another life that you know she could do what she wanted to do when she wanted to do it. I know that Jefferson Davis wrote the rise and fall of the Confederate government, which are his memoirs. We've interviewed a descendant of Ulysses Grant and we discussed on that podcast about how Grant wrote his memoirs. He was literally dying and it was primarily to generate income, something for his family to survive on, for his wife to survive on. 
Do you think that Davis had the same objective? I'm not sure that his financials weren't in his thought process, but his thought process went way past that. Remember I told you he wanted his day in court. He was never granted that day in court. And it weighed on him until 1878 when he said, I'm going to write my memoir. I tell people that if you have insomnia, that book is a sure cure for it. <laughs> Davis is as eloquent as anybody writing. I mean, some of the, you know, to say that he walked across the street might take a paragraph. It's just one of those moments he writes with such clarity in his own mind, but it's got a lot of wordsmithing. I mean, there's a lot of it in there. But it's his defense of the Confederacy and his position. And that's his court case. And that's what it's all about. It's his defense that he never got the opportunity. And when it was published, it's way too late. You know, 1881, war has been over 15 years. People don't even remember what's going on and could care less. And they don't really want to read about the Confederate government. Long since gone, 1876, the Reconstruction period's over. The world's gone on past that. So the book itself was not at all successful. If you want a copy, I've got a couple <laughs> still here from, from the ones that weren't sold. I mean, I've got a couple, of, and I actually have his own copy of it that's got his notes in it, talking about the changes he would make to it. So wow. not a very popular book. No, no, it's not good beach reading. Depends on what you want to do at the beach. <laughs> if you want yeah. to sleep, it's well, great, sleep, right? Yeah, it works good for sleeping. <laughs> so Bertram, Let's just talk about the very last days of Jefferson Davis. How did he spend those days? Well, he moved to Biloxi in 1878. He will inherit that property from the owner who dies, and that's where it's going to, his last home is going to be. He's got a great house on the beach. He's got a daughter there. He's happy as he can be being on the Gulf Coast, very religious. He goes to churches. One had an organ and one didn't. And you hear all these tales or whatever, and, and you sit, and it's comforting. It's a comforting place to be on the water. After he wrote his book, I think he found solace in himself. He just was just happy to be alive. But also, he had another issue. He had to come up here a lot because he owned now Davis Island, which the river had cut off in the middle, and he had to manage that property because his son-in-law and daughter moved to Colorado. So he spent a lot of time up here those last four years. And that's actually where he caught what we would say, I guess, is pneumonia. Mm. He got a boat and went down to, to New Orleans, and that's where he will pass away. Now, when you said up here, he spent time up Vicksburg. Up in Vicksburg. Okay. How old was he when he passed away? 81. And you explained earlier in this talk about how the Hayes Davis name came into play, which, which is super interesting that that was the time of his funeral. It's kind of cool for me to think, and I... I think you and I talked about this in an earlier discussion was that you knew your grandfather mm -hmm. and your grandfather mm -hmm. actually was in the presence and was alive at the same time as Jefferson Davis. So even though great, great grandfather sounds so far back, it's really not. And you know, it's it, my grandfather was the youngest, my great aunt, his sister, who I knew very well, didn't speak a word about Jefferson other, other than high esteem. She had a couple of Davis artifacts that she wanted to make sure went to the right place. And, but not a mention about what kind of grandfather he was. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to pose this to you. How do you think Jefferson Davis is generally thought of today? Not the right way. I don't know how to put that, but I think, America has lost its sense of history. Jefferson Davis is one sentence in a history book. I remember in high school when we got to the Civil War and that one sentence came up and I looked at it and said, I'm the only one in this room who's got anybody in this book. But that's all there was. It's not anything about that. So today we have that same type of look at people. One sentence in a history book, and that defines it. And you define them on basis of what somebody else has told you. We don't have a lot of resource to say this is who he was before or after. It's that one moment that defines Jefferson Davis. 
America today wants to eliminate anything that has a negative connotation. You know, just we can do that with George Washington. We can do it with Thomas Jefferson. All the great founders of the country are now, you know, they were bad people. And Jefferson Davis is probably on top of the list, not knowing anything else about him. So I think that he's misrepresented a lot. I think he's one of the most misunderstood American history figures that we have. And as you indicated, there were so many things that he did. There's a his military service, his being Secretary of War. And then, of course, you get into the Civil War. He, he was dealing with all sorts of personalities. He, he had a lot of conflict even within the Confederacy, trying to do what he thought was right at that time. The important thing is seeing that a person is the product of their time within their time, but they're more than just one event. They're the, more than just one thing. You have to look at the broader contributions of people. And then you make your own decision. Don't make a decision on an entire person based on one specific event. You have to look at the whole person, and then you can make your decision. That's what I end up with all of my talks. I said, you know, I've told you now all I know about, not all I know, but whatever I can tell you. If it's two and a half hours, it's a little bit more lengthy and you hear a lot more stories. But I tell people, take another look, and that's respect that person for who it is, all of them, not just one part of them. And that way you all can make your mind up if he's bad or good, but it's not for me to do that. My, my job is, is to portray him as a historic figure and give you the facts. You can decide if he's good or bad or whatever the case may be. It's not my judgment to do that. I also put it into the lens of perspective. You know, history has got lenses of perspective. 1850s are not 2022. Mm -hmm. Also, it's three people involved in history. It's the one doing the event, the one the event's affecting, and it's the one reporting the event. And all of those people have a different view of it. You know, you're looking at me and I'm looking at you. You don't know what I'm thinking about you. And I don't know what you're thinking about me, but they're obviously not the same. I mean, we have different ways of looking at it. And then if somebody was recording what we're doing, it'd be even different than what it is that we think is going on. So those are the, the lenses. Yeah, I mean, you you have to be able to like you said, you can't hide history because it's unpleasant. People have to be able to see it, read it, learn about it, understand the period that people lived in. You could come out and say at the end, I've looked at all the facts and I think this person was awful or I think this person was wonderful, but you got to look at all the facts. That's the way I think I would say history should be looked at. I think it's interesting. Some of the podcasts you've done are with people that I know, like Lynn Jackson. Lynn Jackson, and I, I consider her one of my dearest friends. She's the great, great granddaughter of Dred Scott. Lovely lady. When I first met her, we hugged. I mean, we're standing in this room and she's hugging me going, oh, I'm so glad to meet you. And I'm overwhelmed. Like, you're historic. I'm just Bertram. And it's interesting what we've evolved in our relationship is that we all do the same thing. She's giving you a historic perspective. And we met and she said, that's what you do. You're giving a historic perspective from the factual knowledge that you studied and done. I don't have an agenda. I just want you to tell you about it if you want to listen. Absolutely. Thank you for that. So Bertram, Tell me, what are you up to today? What kind of projects do you have going on? We've been very blessed. We've been able to continue my process about educating America about my great-great-grandfather in a couple of ways. I lecture on riverboats when I have the opportunity to do that, talk about him and the war period in the South. We've also recently, four years ago, moved to Vicksburg, Mississippi, his hometown, and I'm walking the same streets that he did. We've actually created a tour company and we take people from the river boats and private tours and groups. We had one yesterday of 31 people, actually. And we take them through the streets of Vicksburg, talking about the history of Vicksburg. And they can't get away without hearing a little bit about 
Jefferson Davis along the way. We're adding a little bit more to the story every time we get a chance. How can people find out about your tours? We have a website. It's VicksburgOldTownTours.com. And on there, you can see who we are and what we do and how we do it. And a couple of smiling pictures of us so you can see what we look like. Well, that's terrific. Well, you are a very knowledgeable and good storyteller. I know you said when you first got the title of president of the Davis family, you were shocked at the time, but boy, you have learned so much about your great, great grandfather and his times. And I thank you so much for doing this podcast with us. And what we like to do is to have history told stories from people's lives, things that happened to people and their ancestors, and just put it out there. Let people listen and decide for themselves. And I want to just thank you for your time. You're a lot of fun to talk with, and I hope that we can continue to talk, Bertram. You've been a pleasure. Thank you, Jim. And I hope America has a new perspective of my great-great-grandfather from your podcasts. Okay. Thanks, Bertram. Have a good night. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Your History, Your Story. You can connect with us on Facebook and YouTube at Your History, Your Story, or on Instagram and Twitter at YHYS Podcast. We'd love to hear from you if you have any questions, comments, or a story to tell. Be well and God bless.